time to go somewhere that's green. Howdy theater fans, this is Broadway Explained, and today we'll be covering the Mankin musical that takes you down Skid Row. This is everything you need to know about the musical Little Shop of Horrors. For more of Broadway's best explanations, please visit our channel and subscribe to receive notifications of our newest videos. Pinpointing the original story that became the inspiration for Little Shop of Horrors is a bit tricky, so let's go back about a hundred years ago. Yeah, that's far enough. In 1905, English writer H.G. Wells, who was famous for stories such as The War of the Worlds, The Time Machine, and The Invisible Man, wrote a relatively unknown story entitled The Flowering of the Strange Orchid. Wells' story, which gave a science fiction spin on newly accepted Darwinian principles, explored the mischief of a bloodthirsty orchid with evil intentions. About 25 years later, another English writer, John Collier, wrote a story entitled Green Thoughts, which featured another malicious man-eating plant, but not many people remember this story. 25 years after that, Arthur C. Clarke, another famous English writer, known for his groundbreaking screenplay 2001 A Space Odyssey, wrote a short story entitled, get this, The Reluctant Orchid. Who the heck are you? I, I just told you that, listen, listen, I'm from the future. How dare you point at me? You, you were pointing first. Rude to point. You're being very rude. You're not even believing what Which I'm Which one pointed I'm first? Spider-Man pointed first, am. obviously. You're Similar to Wells and Collier, Clark focuses on another man-eating orchid that also feasts on human blood. After the publishing of these three stories, in 1960, screenwriter Charles B. Griffith and director Roger Corman brought audiences a horror comedy film called The Little Shop of Horrors. Initially distributed as a B-movie, or a low-budget motion picture paired in a double feature with a better publicized blockbuster, the film eventually acquired a status as a cult classic. It was this cult classic that would eventually inspire and serve as a breakthrough for a relatively unknown composer and a relatively unknown lyricist. These two individuals were Alan Menken and Howard Ashman. While the two had previously collaborated on a 1979 musical, Kurt Vonnegut's God Bless You Mr. Rosewater, Little Shop of Horrors would be their big break. The musical would be greatly inspired by the 1960 film, with elements of horror, comedy, and bubblegum rock coming to largely define the show. It's bubblegum rock and roll. Little Shop of Horrors would briefly find its origins in 1982 in an off-off-Broadway production venue before moving to the Orpheum Theater, which is still off-Broadway, but not as small. The show was very highly acclaimed, would win a Drama Desk Award, and ran for about five years. In subsequent years, Little Shop of Horrors would explode in popularity, getting a West End run, a feature film, a Broadway run, several national tours, and an eventual revival. Alan Menken and Howard Ashman would go on to be involved in huge projects, basically constructing the soundtrack of the entire Disney Renaissance in the 1990s. However, Little Shop of Horrors would be among their most popular independent and successful contribution, becoming a very beloved show produced on all levels. This is Andrews, I pooped in the pot again. I'm gonna need somebody to clean me up. <laughs> it's really bad this time. Little Shop of Horrors is a story of science fiction, love, horror, and what happens when getting everything you want turns out terribly wrong. The story opens with a narrator reflecting on a grim time when the human race encountered a deadly threat to its very existence. This almost robotic monologue is a subtle callback to the cinematic roots of the musical. From there, the tone changes to a rock-based bubblegum pop number sung by three female leads. Crystal, Vonette, and Chiffon, self-aware street urchins who backdrop most of the musical, set the stage and bring the audience into the interior of Mushnick's Skid Row florists. The flower shop is owned by Mr. Mushnick, a businessman on Skid Row who employs two young adults. The first is Seymour Krellborn, who is a small, meek, and clumsy orphan that lives in the flower shop. The second is Audrey, who is a pretty blonde woman who is very kind and shy, but also a tad bit awkward. Audrey is revealed to be in an abusive relationship and seems to always come in with fresh bruises. Regardless, Seymour is smitten with Audrey, but he's not confident enough to admit it to her. The three lament in the depressing atmosphere of the downtown urban skid row, and they all yearn to leave the neighborhood one day. Upon hearing the flower shop will be closing, Seymour reveals that he's been looking after a strange plant akin to a Venus flytrap. The audience soon learns that the flytrap appeared during a solar eclipse and that Seymour has named it Audrey too out of adoration for Audrey. Ow. After the Audrey too rings up business for the flower shop, Mushnick pushes Seymour to care for it and to see it grow. When the plant appears to be dying, Seymour is puzzled that none of his more conventional botany methods have worked. In a fuss, he pricks his own finger on a thorn and soon learns that the Audrey 2 craves blood. Allowing the plant to suck from his finger, the Audrey 2 grows bigger. 
This leads to increased traffic for the flower shop, and Seymour is given praise and attention for the first time in his life. Meanwhile, Audrey yearns for a better life in suburbia, away from her boyfriend and Skid Row. She is revealed to have a bit of a dreamlike fantasy, which includes her own house, a family, and a romantic relationship with Seymour. <laughs> Due to the increased business and traffic from the Audrey 2, the flower shop is renovated and Seymour, Audrey, and Mushnik are adjusting to a newly prosperous lifestyle. Meanwhile, the Audrey 2 has grown dramatically, practically to the size of a person. We are then introduced to Orange Gravello, Audrey's abusive boyfriend and a leather-wearing, motorcycle-driving dentist. Orin is revealed to be a sadist, relishing in the pain and torture of others, including his girlfriend and patient. While visiting the shop, he tries to encourage Seymour to leave Skid Row, take the plant, and make his own fortune instead of just lining Mushnik's pocket. Mushnik overhears this conversation and realizes that he needs to retain Seymour before he becomes too wise. Mushnik then takes advantage of Seymour's naive nature and offers to adopt him and make him a business partner. Seymour, admittingly happy, accepts the offer and gleefully shares the news with the Audrey too. Speaking of which, Seymour has been having trouble keeping the plant alive, not producing enough blood to keep the plant satisfied. It is revealed that the Audrey too can speak and it tries to make a devilish compact with Seymour. If fed, the Audrey too will help Seymour realize all of his dreams, including a life with the other Audrey. Demanding blood, Seymour refuses, but after witnessing Orin abuse Audrey, he reluctantly agrees to kill for the plant. He arranges a dental appointment with Orin with the intent of killing him. However, Seymour's courage falls apart and he's stuck with Orin. Before torturing him, Orin fastens on a special face mask only to have it stuck. With copious amounts of nitrous oxide flowing into his lungs, Orin giggles uncontrollably, but begins to asphyxiate. <laughs> He begs Seymour to help remove the mask, but seeing this as an opportunity to carry out his original plan, Seymour does nothing. Orin finally suffocates on the gas, and Seymour dismembers the body. Act 1 ends with Seymour feeding Orin's remains to the Audrey 2, which maniacally laughs as Seymour hesitatingly feeds it and covers up his tracks. Act 2 begins with Seymour and Audrey being swamped with orders at the flower shop. Busier than ever, Mushnik's flower shop is even more popular and profitable due to the Audrey 2. After the two close up for the day, Audrey confides in Seymour that she feels guilty about Orin's mysterious disappearance. While she admittingly feels free, Audrey feels guilty that she wished Orin would go away. Tension breaks and the two admit that they have feelings for each other. Seymour promises that he will be there for Audrey and she lets go of some bottled up emotions. After they confess their love, Seymour and Audrey kiss before being interrupted by Mushnik. Confronting Seymour about the disappearance of Orin, Mushnik is suspicious that Seymour had killed him. Citing his baseball cap, blood drops, Orin's uniform, and Seymour and Audrey kissing, Mushnik is on to him. Seymour denies this, knowing that he technically did not kill Orin and that he died by his own devices. Mushnik wants to take Seymour to the police, where he would likely be convicted of murder. The Audrey too speaks to Seymour as he contemplates what to do and advises him to take out Mushnik. Fearing that his success and future with Audrey are on the line, Seymour tricks Mushnik into going inside of the plant to fetch the shop's revenue receipts. This leads to the Audrey too inevitably gobbling up Mushnik whole. It's okay though, I've been swimming a lot lately. Mm -hmm, yummy. Mm -hmm. In the days after, Seymour assumes full ownership of the flower shop and is pestered by a menagerie of characters ranging from salesmen to reporters who offer him fame and fortune. Seymour is fearful that if he accepts the offer, he will have to continue to sustain the Audrey too, which means killing others. At the same time, he is worried that if he doesn't continue to accumulate success, then Audrey won't like him or want to build a life with him anymore. He reluctantly accepts the offers and agrees to continue to give in to the Audrey 2's demands. Back at the shop, as it harkens for more blood, Seymour begins to go a little crazy and threatens to destroy the plant. Audrey walks in, and is bewildered by Seymour's new level of apparent stress. After inquiring about the absence of Mushnik, Audrey reveals to Seymour that she still loves him without the fame, fortune, and the plant. Seymour then decides that he will destroy the Audrey 2 after an interview with Life magazine, but Audrey is confused and frightened by Seymour's frantic behavior. At this point, Every character, with the exception of Seymour and the urchins, believe that the plant is inanimate and Seymour comes off as a little crazy. He assures Audrey that everything will be okay and sends her home for the night. This is fine. I'm okay with the events that are unfolding currently. Seymour is continuously tormented by the plant and eventually offers to feed it raw meat. After he leaves the shop, Audrey approaches, unable to sleep and worried about Seymour. Wanting to talk to him, Audrey enters the shop, finding only the plant who she can now hear talking. The plant tempts Audrey to water it, and she complies. 
Audrey is then attacked by the plant as it attempts to swallow her whole. Seymour returns just in time and wrestles Audrey from the clutches of the plants. Unfortunately, she is mortally wounded and the two share one final moment together. Audrey's dying wish is to be fed to the plant so that it can continue to bring good things to Seymour. As she dies in Seymour's arms, he reluctantly honors her request and places her inside of the plant to be devoured. Devastated with grief, Seymour is almost catatonic and the scene transitions into the next day. Not knowing how evil it is, a wholesale distributor approaches Seymour with the idea of taking leaf cutlets of the Audrey II so that every household in America could own one. He leaves Seymour to think about it, but he is unresponsive. Little by little, Seymour finally realizes that the plant's goal of world domination is about to be put into motion. All along, the Audrey II has been using Seymour to grow strong enough to spread across the world. He tries destroying the plant with a gun and with rat poison, but it is too strong. In a last ditch effort, he dives inside the Audrey II to hopefully destroy it from within. As the two battle, the plant quickly prevails, gobbling up Seymour in the process. The wholesaler returns, but he is unable to find Seymour. He instructs Crystal, Rana, and Chiffon to take leaf cuttings so that the Audrey II can be marketed to every household in America. The urchins reveal that subsequent to this, the plants expanded across America, tricking people into feeding them blood in a quest for world domination. The Audrey II, now the root, pun intended, of all this evil, is now bigger and more powerful than ever. The plant is revealed to have flowers showing the faces of Orin, Mushnik, Seymour, and Audrey, who beg the audience that no matter how persuasive the plants may come across, they must not be fed. The show closes with the Audrey II menacingly approaching the audience, and the curtain closes before the plant could expand any further. The show ends on a more horrific note, and ends with a look on a more cautionary tale. Anyway, that is everything you need to know about the musical Little Shop of Horrors. What do you guys think? Did we miss anything? Would you change anything about Little Shop of Horrors? What show would you like us to cover next? Leave a comment and share with anyone else who might be interested. Remember to subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Broadway Explained. And... Curtain.